Good afternoon, gentlemen. We're going to have Nate Wise from BYU Idaho to talk about the Aquila Sinking Tool. All right. So I'm going to grab this uh, presentation um, and talk about uh, what Aquila is. Aquila is it's a Pearson product. Um, it's a it's a digital repository. It's our personal cloud, I guess, for our learning objects and, and that, um, that that we've used. We adopted it about, it's about three years ago uh, when we first kind of went with, uh, decided on Equella. We looked at some different options. Um, uh, but this one had the most functionality, most out of the box uh, functionality for a learning content repository. And so we really liked what it would do and what it would do as far as library content and the digital rights management that went around that. Um, and it really kind of sold us on it. It was not the, the cheapest option, um, uh, but it, the, the functionality and the ease of use and the ability to, um, to really adapt it to, to our needs is, is what I'll show you here. Um, the native application and kind of how it works to create a contribution and uh, the new tool that uh, we developed on campus to to kind of ease some of that and make it a little bit uh, more user friendly for for faculty and others to get their content into um, into Aquila. Now a couple of years ago I did uh, a quick presentation at uh, Northwest Met when we were um, up in Kalispell, and I talked a little bit about about what we were doing here, and I talked about it in the sense of of opening doors, and it's the idea of having open content and sharing this content across campus, across courses, and across departments, and, and things like that. And there is some content that, because we've had it shareable and available, that it's it's really been been helpful. We've been able to to um, have opportunity where, say, uh, an, an anatomy course that had skull images uh, was being used by an art course for head drawing and things like that. And so some of their learning objects were being used in the visual arts department, which they would have never have guessed. And then Exercise Science found out about this collection of, of resources. And were, had they not been open and discoverable, then, then you know, they would have had to come up with their own their own options, and uh, it is cloud-based, um, and, it, and it really has helped uh, kind of put this into context for us as as a you know a single cloud, I guess, to to coin what um, Raul was talking about for all of our content, and it makes it uh, you know in the library we like it because we can catalog everything and we can search it. We've connected this to our um, our discovery service in the library, so things that are in here can also be discovered through the library discovery service and harvest that we can harvest other collections into this. So a lot of the stuff that's out there on Internet Archive, we can pull in and, and have those uh, items discoverable as, as well. So it really is like a, a giant library of, of campus content, things that is, has been created on campus and other third party content that we've got available. We've got a, an agreement with um, Harvard Business School where we host all of the case studies, um, the Harvard Business case studies. So we've got a whole collection of the Harvest, Harvard Business case studies. And the reason why we can do that is because, of course, they've given us permission to host that and provided us with the files. But uh, Equilla also allows a, a very robust reporting engine. So we can report unique views. And so they just simply we pull the report of how many views um, of those items have occurred, or unique views, and then we pay them the royalties according to our, our usage on that. So they're discoverable. And there's some of the onesie twosie things they don't charge us for anything over five views. They figure it's being used in a class. If it's, if it's viewed one time, it's somebody checking it out to see if it's going to work, or maybe somebody's using it in a paper. So, so they're allowing us to, to use it in that. And Equal has, has allowed. Uh, us that functionality and had made you know managing that content much easier. Um, so when I'd done this before, I talked about Monsters Inc. and how 
you know, when they, when, when Sully and, and Mike rode the door into the, the big door warehouse and, and how that reposit, repository worked. It's all XML based. Um, it's, it's very Google-esque and some people don't like that about it. Um, they've complained that, oh, it's harder to use and I'm used to files and folders of a computer, but, but we'll very quickly we'll go to Google and, and grab the first things that come up. And this works a lot the same way. You search for content and it's there, but it's only as good as the metadata that's behind it. So everything is, is uh, the items are like the, the different doors, right? And behind those doors, they can have several items. So it's not one contribution per item. You can have a whole course uh, listed as an item and have several things in there. And I can show you a couple examples of that as we go through. Um, all the items are tagged with um, and cataloged with metadata. So, I mean, title and description are required, but then we'll also um, put in the course, um, uh, the expiration dates, if those things apply, and those kind of things that, that, that we do that. So, there's different collections um, um, in, in the repository. So, we've got a collection, like I said, of the Harvard business cases. We've got another collection of Swank Digital Campus films, and so there's about 300 films that can be streamed, and they're licensed films, and they're all in a separate collection, so they can be searched and, and discovered in there. Then there's the faculty content collection, and there's the online fac or course lead managed collection, and other collections that we can do. There's a recent one that we created was a storehouse collection where HR was looking for a way to have um, a collection of resources that, that staff and faculty and other administrative offices might be able to, hey, this might apply, I'm using it in my office, but maybe it's going to work for someone else, and um, this is the way we do things. And so we created the BYU-Idaho Storehouse, and, and it's really HR content and, you know, motivational or leadership things or so there's several categories that they wanted to do and so we created a catalog of those things and applied a workflow so when somebody submits something they didn't want it just to go live they wanted to have their eyes on it first they were a little controlling that way but this would accommodate that so we were able to set up a workflow that gives them the option to approve or reject items that are contributed to that collection and so they can approve or reject items and um, and then make those available um, across campus. So basically this is when you go to contribute something currently um, in Aquila or natively in the object, you, you create a contribution wizard now and those are customizable. You can, you can have it as, as granular or um, simple as you want. So it depends on how much metadata you want to capture. And so you create basically a, a web page, an XML page that, that gathers this content based on your metadata schema that's developed. And, and you require you know, some input. You see this has uh, about three different sections you know, that, that we could go through. And um, as you go through those, you see it is the title, um, description, abstract, the attachments, and that's where you get the different types of, of files. So you can upload a file, you can link to a YouTube video, you can add a Kaltura video, all from, from within this. But there's no, um, pretty much any file type it'll take unless it's one of those restricted files that we said, yeah, that might be a virus, we're not gonna allow that. Uh, so you can limit the types of files that way. And then there's the media type we wanna capture. You can see there's quite a bit of metadata that we're, we're wanting faculty to catch. And this was also one of our, has been one of our barriers to entry. Um, faculty aren't crazy about having to catalog their content. They don't like to do it. It's hard. It, they don't have time. You know, uh, all of us are limited on our time. Um, so the Equella Sync tool that you guys probably saw me install takes a lot of this out of the, out of, um, out of the picture. We're able to capture that one time and have it auto fill those, those things in it. But we use the APIs to create this sync tool to allow um, easier contributions. Um, 
one of the things that faculty were not crazy about was the inability to to have their uh, to contribute a folder that had items in it. And and now we can create that uh, those items and those folders just a, a drag and drop uh, capability there that they didn't have before. So the things that uh, that the the REST API is allowed in that and that they were willing to, to open those up and, and allowed us to do this development really helped us overcome some of these barriers to entry that people had. And now it's, it's uh, um, really our proselytizing trying to get people to say, hey, I know you probably saw this before and we're crazy about adding all the metadata, but have you seen the sync tool? And kind of going out there and doing that. So the things that the REST API are going to do, uh, obviously it needs to authenticate the user, which it can easily do. Create a new contribution, so it has to create um, and add a file area. So in the database, essentially Aquila is a database, so it has to create that file area and list of those files. Uh, checks for an item lock. If you're editing something, you don't want to be contributing to it, so it, it'll lock it if somebody's in the middle of editing something. Um, um, and if it doesn't have a lock, it'll lock it so it can create something, and then it'll clear that lock once the item is, is created. So it'll copy that file area, upload the attachment, edit the contribution representation and metadata, so any of that metadata that we needed to add to it, we can pull from the file or from that program. It'll save that, clear the lock, and log out the user. And so what John used as he developed this was Python, and Python's an open application that can be used to, um, for the cross-platform development. It was very usable in, in creating um, the, the instance and what he wanted to do. So he could do Mac or Windows or Linux and would allow that. So back to the Monsters, Inc. Um, content.byui.edu is the, is the web address. And so that's, you can, you can contribute going that direction or you can go there and search for your content. Um, or you can use the Aquila Sync tool to manage all of your own content right from your desktop. Um, you can drag and drop files and folders uh, into a, a sync folder. So basically you create a sync folder on your, on your desktop or somewhere and then you can, can just manage your content right within there. And it makes it very easy as we're looking at moving from one learning management system to another, having a repository that's kind of by itself is going to make some of this lots easier because you can, uh, whether you are adopting this new one or in between, either place that has the link to that content, you're going to be okay if you're managing that content. You can grab those those URLs and, and post it either in the desire to learn or back in the, the uh, Agilic Spring Honey. Um, so again, the the Aquila Sync tool will allow you to, to edit the files, add URLs, and reuse and share this content um, and work with others. I talked about the, the ability, the portability, which is, allows that to be accessed anywhere. It's cloud-based. Um, and it also is um, ADA compliant in as much as the content that gets put in there is ADA compliant. I mean, so you still have, have those issues that, that you would deal with like with anything, with any uh, learning content. But it's portable. Um, if somebody goes, they can download their content, or if they have an Aquila Sync folder, they still have control of that. They're not giving up anything to the university. You know, if there's those uh, players that, I don't want this to, to go out there. So that, that keeps them from, from losing it. I talked about the reporting for like the uh, use and some analytics that way that you can you can see who's viewing your content or how much content. So there's a lot of different reporting. It uses uh, BERT, uh, uh, business intelligence application. There's what it uh, runs the reports on and connect and can and, uh, create kind of really any report that you want based on that metadata that you've got available. Uh, they're looking at adding outcomes as part of that metadata. So it's so it really kind of depends on how how you want to do it. The additional benefits of the sync tool is it's, it's a shortcut really to the My Resources area of Equella. So instead of having to go into the Equella interface and clicking My Resources tab and then searching uh, through that, you've got one spot that says here's all your stuff 
and here's where you can get that um, content. The Contribution Manager allows quick access to search, access, and copy links, and also hide attachments. Sometimes people will upload like web pages that have folders. You don't want the whole folders, you, you know, so you want just that HTML file. And so you can hide those other folders and still have it uh, work correctly and, and grab that URL. Uh, provides quick and easy contact method for somebody who has a question but doesn't know who to ask. So this is something that John, as he developed that, added a little help feature, and I'll show you that help feature, but it, it will send him an email, and in that email it'll take a screenshot automatically of, of their desktop, and then sends him that email saying, hey, I'm using Equella Sync, and I have this question, and, and wherever they're at, whether he'll steal a screenshot from them, and I don't know that they're aware that that's even happening, but at least he can see kind of what, what they're seeing. Um, so basically they'll access it through the URL, they can search, contribute, and share, and then they can get their, their resources. So they're, they're really it's, it's a way to, to open doors to the sharing and, and collaboration that we're trying to, to get to. But it's been kind of a challenge because you know we didn't, we didn't start off and it wasn't something that, that came from administration saying, this is what we're going to use when we licensed this three years ago. Recently, as of like a month ago, we finally had one of the academic vice presidents say, this is our academic object repository and this is the direction we're going. And so you guys that are using Google Drive for some stuff and, and Box or Dropbox, if it's, if it's academic course related content, it really should go here. Um, so it can be supported and, and we can be familiar with that. Not that we're pulling the plug on any of those other services, but it's, but it's the one at least we've got their blessing now that we didn't have before, that, uh, that we were trying to, to grow this um, just from the ground up. So again, this is the, the original interface. On the dashboard, um, you can kind of see that the dashboard's customizable. I can kind of look in here and see who's contributing. Um, there's a favorites area. You can do a quick search, but the navigation on this side, you have a favorites area, the My Resources, and this is what we're talking about, the My Resources. You can come in here and see what are My Resources, how many things. Uh, in this dev instance, I only have a few things. In the, in the live instance, in the My Resources area, you know, I've got 648 published. The drafts area are things that are not searchable across campus, but are available only to me. They're not published, so they're in draft mode. Um, I can still share these, these URLs um, with students or in a course, and they'll work just the same whether they're published or whether they're draft, but they're just not searchable within the repository. So somebody else can't find and use some of these things. Um, the scrapbook area is, is kind of a, just a storage um, area. There, those are also links that can be shared. They're not searchable. So it's similar to a draft, but even a step uh, further as far as security goes. And the moderation queue and the archive are things that, well, you, you quit using the moderation key has to do with workflows. So if you're one of those guys approving or rejecting content, there may be something in a moderation uh, queue. And since Pearson purchased this product, um, there's also uh, this option for purchased content. Uh, and you can set up shops. And I think it was their idea uh, eventually to move to you know, licensing content that way. But, uh, so the functionality is there, but, but we really haven't done much with that. Um, on this other side, the search gives you the option to search through content. You can see the different uh, collections that we've got here. Here's the Harvard Business Case Studies. And there's, um, what is there, about 28,800 different case studies that are available there that can be linked to. Um, and these are the links to the items. So in Aquila, you've got an item. 
and then you've got an attachment. So an item is basically the folder that that, that attachment is in. And that's kind of the reason I say that is because you know, visually it's, it's flat, it's just metadata. But for people to think about that and then for the Aquila Sync tool, that's kind of the way we went with that. So let me just show you the Aquila Sync tool and how that works. So it's this icon here, Aquila Sync. And when I uh, right click on that, I've got, it tells me what version it's on. The My Preferences is where when I set this up the first time, I can put in my user ID, my net ID, and where is your sync directory? So what folder are you using? Here I'm of course using just a desktop folder. What collection do you want this content to go in? So I'm going to say I'm going to go into the uh, faculty content collection. Uh, I can put a description with that if I want, uh, but this description is going to get changed depending on what files get uploaded. But here I can choose my college um, and department and whether my generally what mode am I using. Is it a face-to-face, -face, is it online, is it both? And you'll be able to, to, to change those as you contribute things. Um, so you can add your courses. So I'm going to say Ed 206 and maybe Ed 200. Um, and whether you want it to go to the test server or the live server. And so I'll save those options. And I can come back to the Aquila Sync. And there's where they manage their contributions. And this is really the most, this is where things are going to happen. That initial one, the preferences that you set that up kind of once, and after that you kind of manage these, these items. So you, you can select all of these things. Right now the Aquila Sync folder you can see is empty. And so it's not so much a sync as it is a push. So you're going to push things up or pull things down. But you can keep things synced up. Um, so if I select, let me just grab a couple of these things. I'm going to unselect it. I'm just going to grab the first few. So I'm going to download those items. So you see down here it's going to download those. So it's putting those into the Aquila Sync folder. So those items are now in, the, in that space where I can add content or I can edit those existing things without ever opening that interface again, that web interface. So it downloads those, those items. It must have been something that was a little bigger. But again, this is from the test server. Um, but it'll also let me see anything that I'm a collaborator. If, some, if somebody has shared an item with me or added me as a collaborator, that I could work on or edit those items, those things would show up in this list as well. Uh, you can replace items or you can push things back up if, if it's not the latest version. Um, so a faculty member would go in there and grab his content if he's already uploaded content. If he doesn't have any content, then it's just a matter of, of creating a folder in here. So I'll let this finish up as it downloads and I'll show you kind of how that editing. These buttons, um, that are in here. This was made um, with uh, PyQt is the what the what he used to to create the the interface here. Um, these buttons. This will take you to the contribution. This is the to copy the link to the contribution, and this will show you those attachments in. Again, the contribution is the file, the folder level, and the attachments are down at the the files within those folders. So. If I grab this, I can go in here and say um, these files that, that are there. If there are videos, I can also upload those to Kaltura. That was another um, option here. So you can upload audio or video right into Kaltura. So it'll create those entries in both Equella and Kaltura at the same time using their, their API. So it's kind of a nice um, addition. So this is finished downloading. So now my Equella sync folder now has these items in it. Um, so in here, here's one PDF file. 
Um, if I add a new folder, it immediately says, oh, there's something new in that folder, and it pops up this option where I can change what my defaults are. Oh, this is for Ed 206, and I just need to put in the description, ask me which collection it goes in. Um, my college and department, I probably don't need to change that unless I'm teaching in another department. This is just for face-to-face. And the publish status, do you want to publish it so others can find and use it, or do you want to leave it as a draft where it's only your content? And so those are the t other options that are there. Um, so if I click OK, it's going to create that contribution in Aquila. So I'm going to go to the URL, and you'll see it'll pull that up just so you can kind of see how it's created that. It's timed me out. So it's created that, that folder. But you can see there's no attachments right now, but it does show you. There's the description. There's the delivery modes. So all of that content is there. So now, uh, if you wanted to, to add something to that, so let me just grab, see if there's any documents. There's no documents. Um, let me just grab something from one of these other folders. So here's my test folder. So I'm just going to paste this into, into that and it um, immediately upload. I don't know if you saw the little window. Now if I refresh this, it should show that there's now a file that's in there. Oh, it's still locked. So while it uploads, it just unlocked. So I'm going to refresh this again. And now that PDF file is there and ready to be ready to be used. So I can share that uh, that URL, um, but it but it immediately puts it up there. So instead of instead of having to go through, here's the test Northwest Met. If I click on that, you can see. There's that, there's that item, so I can copy that. I can go to the attachment, I can copy the link to the attachment, and then I can plug that into um, Brightspace or, or wherever it's, um, and so this will stay open for me. If I go into the library sandbox, I just paste that item in there. And that item now is in the in that D2L space. So now I've got the that PDF file of of the, from that content. So it just makes it a little bit easier to to grab that content and have that link. So if we wanted to edit that that file, as long as we've put it up there with the same name, uh, it's that link will be maintained. Now if I just replace that file that's going to break the link because it's going to have a different name because it uh, it will it can change that because that that URL is based on that file name. So as long as there as that file name is the same, then that that link can be maintained. But we were able to to 
in part migrating some of the content. There was a, a religion course, and they were wanting to see how long would it take for, for us to move these eight units into, into Aquila from our old learning management system to have it ready to go into Brightspace. And so using this sync tool, we were able to, three of us working together within just a couple hours, had the whole course, uh, the content in that course moved over and grabbing it from, from Box and, and easily creating uh, a PDF document so, uh, or Word documents or whatever they were in there. But we were able to easily, using that folder, so if there was a, um, somebody had a, a Word document in here, going to add a new Word document. And I might have to push that up. Let me see. Oh, no, there it went. So now that, that same... Test? I don't think it was. Oh, it was clearing content. That's where I put it. Okay. I couldn't remember where I put it. <laughs> so now that mm -hmm. Word document is in there. Uh, say that Word document we needed to um, close this. Say we needed a PDF of that because uh, it wasn't showing up on my iPad. So I want a PDF of that document. So instead of having to, to, to go out, I can go just into that same Equilla Sync folder. I can go into that new document. I can open it in Word, save it as a PDF, wherever it's at. Oh, there we go. And now I've got that without having to go anywhere else. I've got it saved in the same spot. And that item now shows up as, as one of those attachments. And I can grab the, I can copy that URL and go into Brightspace or whatever and paste that item in there. So it just allows for quick editing and, and and management, so you can manage your content from your desktop instead of having to go into into Equella, find it, click edit, which Equella does allow you to edit in place, but it uses a Java applet, and and it, it sometimes can be clunky or it doesn't work the way you expect it to, or there's too many clicks involved, where having just a single folder allows you to quickly just drop that in there and, and update it. Um, so that was a much easier way to, to get into that content. See on this right hand side, basically what's happening as we do this, it's like clicking edit this version. And you can see why people weren't crazy about it, because then it comes back into this contribution wizard. You have to go down to the edit this item. And if I want to add something, you know, I, can, I can still add another resource or I can edit this existing one, or I can replace it. But it's, it just makes it easier, it makes it more intuitive at the folder level. That's what people are used to. And so that's kind of how that, um, that has worked. Uh, and it's really helped establish that um, as, a, as, a, as a more viable option. Because a lot of faculty, they didn't understand the, the contribution wizard. and how that was supposed to work, or how they could, how they could um, use that in their favor. Um, we're also able to deliver um, e-textbooks and and other content this way. We've started um, so online text. This is kind of a, a publishing platform for faculty that they can provide textbooks, or if they've written a textbook, and there's a way to search and filter those items. Um, 
that they've got in a collection. So in faculty, there's a textbook search. I can say, show me anything that has, that's been marked a textbook, and it will bring back and return those items, whether they're PDF files or EPUB, and, and there are some instructors that are doing that. Uh, the, um, the bookstore is a little hesitant. They still haven't given us a clickable link to point students to those other books, but they can copy the link from the bookstore that points them this way, and we're hoping to have them make that clickable in the near future. Um, but those are some of the ways that we're, we're using Equella. Um, some of the ways that we promoted that as uh, trying to get faculty to get it. It's been kind of a long process. So some of the things that we did, uh, we created some promo videos. Um, so I lied, there's a little bit of content here. It's just a short clip. So we did one that was more professional. And this is Arlen kind of talking about Equella and, and BYU-Idaho. You probably can't hear that. more shareable with others. And Equella lets us meet those requirements. So that's just a small clip of, of the video. So that one was, you know, a little bit more refined and, and uh, more professional. Arlen had his students do another one. And you've probably seen similar types to try to, to get faculty to know what Equella was and how, how it could be used. Ah, I clicked the, I clicked there. Corny, but uh, it helped kind of get the message out that hey, this is this is what we can do, and we've got a spot to help you. The Faculty Technology Center knows what Aquella is, and they can help move your content. There's a way that we can bulk import content. There's an EBI tool and Aquella bulk importer. There's a metadata utility that allows um, that metadata to be bulk changed if we had to add or change an owner or things like that. So it just makes it very user friendly that way, an easy way to, to manage it. Um, um, these web pages are delivered through Equella, so it's just another option to, to create content and deliver content or embedded videos and things like that. So, so it's very flexible and it's a platform that we've liked because we can get it to do pretty much whatever we want if we can develop against it. And this sync tool just really um, made, lowered that barrier to entry for a lot of faculty. And really was kind of exciting to see how that, how that really spurred the, the uptick and, and the grassroots. So we were able to, to go to a faculty office and sit down with them and, and take a few minutes to install it. And because they already know how to move files and folders and copy and paste, it was fairly intuitive for them to to see how it goes. Some of them still don't know how to work Equella, but their content is there, whether they know it or not. But they can copy those links and, and manage that content using that Equella sync tool and never even log into Equella. So it, it really makes it kind of nice for them. But then other people, because they've added their content, unless they've marked it as draft, that content is discoverable for others to find and use. Um, whether or not they find and use it, that's we're still not that far down the road, but uh, but that's the idea. Is it can be it can be repurposed and, and reused. So um, that's basically what the the app is and does. And I'd be glad to answer other questions about either the Aquila app or uh, that we developed or the platform itself. So Nate, what is 
is the app one that was provided by Equella and you guys modified it or you guys just cooked this thing we up on your own? It. Uh, John Fackrell we hired, um, he's, he's just very talented. He wrote it in, in Python and, and just leveraging the APIs that were available. And, uh, and so we've shared that. They took it and presented it at Equella's conference in North Carolina earlier this year at their Navigate North America and showed that to them and and initially Quilla was interested. Uh, I didn't know if they were going to buy it, but they would said, "Hey, we're going to make this available for other people to use. So if you're not interested, we're just going to make it available. So that may be the route that we're going to go, just to share that functionality and and get it out there because there's a lot of people that want to use it that way and it makes it easier. And it's right now, of course, it's customized for our metadata schema, but it's but that's really part, of, that's just a, a small part of that program that's written. And so it can be easily adapted to, to any institution. <laughs> so, um, you know, Boise State has been looking at content management systems in general, and Aquel is one of the ones that uh, keeps coming up in conversation. Um, what were some of the bigger challenges you had with implementing Aquella in general, um, either from faculty adoption or technology or any of those kind of challenges? I think the, the biggest problem that we had on campus was probably with our online learning department. They were, they'd gone through about three different restructuring and, and there are some that, that didn't like the idea that it, I think that it wasn't their idea, but they also also uh, had problems with the initial workflow they wanted to do was very complicated. Um, I think we've got the, the personnel that, that we can do it now because we have a better understanding of the product, but then they were trying to mold the product into their current workflow and, and it just wasn't working for them. So we had kind of this battle with them in adoption, but uh, from, from the standpoint of, of getting it and having it do what they advertised it would do, it, it did it. Um, and it just, it runs. We're, it's hosted, so we're not hosting it ourselves. And I guess that's some of the, the problem, but, um, or can be, because you don't have the button to say, hey, let's reboot this. We had an issue where it wasn't clearing users. Um, and so they had too many logged on users and we needed to have them bounce it and they wanted to bounce it in the middle of the day and I said no, but they've improved their, improved their data center and, and their responsiveness has really improved and we've, they've come a long ways in that. So that's really helped um, and, and we've had good conversation. We've had a bi-weekly call with, with both the support team and with some of their, uh, their, their sales rep, our account rep, and to deal with uh, issues and questions that they've had on their SLA and things like that, but it's been it's been robust that we've um, shared the licensing with LDS Business College and just starting to get them on. They haven't seen the Aquila Sync yet, but we're going to get ready to onboard them because they're they've just adopted it and they have a small collection and they need to to roll this out to faculty. But they were concerned that oh, it's going to be too hard to use. But I think with with this tool, it's really going to help them promote it and and get that acceptance and stuff right off the bat where you wouldn't have to deal with, oh, I don't want to deal with four pages of, of the uh, contribution wizard. Mm -hmm. So so that's probably the, was the biggest thing is, you know, how much metadata do you want to require and how do you capture that? And <coughs> one of the other things is sometimes it does too well. Uh, one of the challenges I had as the digital content and licensing guy uh, they have the option of putting on DRM, Digital Rights Management. There was an English textbook or an English course pack that was developed um, and my zeal is let's protect this because, you know, we need to make sure I had them do a terms of use, you know, by using this you're not going to print or distribute. And it worked so well that if they didn't access it by going to the item level before clicking the attachments, it was locking them out mm. and and so they could still get to it but they had to go down the yellow brick road and if they tried to shortcut it it was it wasn't working and so that was kind of a frustration I was able to fix that with the metadata utility I said 
never mind on the on the DRM and just took it off of there and so it alleviated that just because uh, with the password protection in both the LMS and in here I wasn't too concerned about about some of that and most of its licensed and we're using it under license anyway so it's not like th there was that much of a risk that would have required a, a DRM mm -hmm. so you know that may be a, a challenge too but you can configure that DRM to be as aggressive or or just a, a, a smaller hurdle right. or n a non-issue. Okay. But it was, um, this was developed originally in Australia and New Zealand. Their copyright laws are, are very rigid mm -hmm. as far as how much content they can release. They, and it has built-in capability to, to go very granular to uh, uh, comply with their copyright licensing uh, agreements that they have in in Australia and, and New Zealand and releasing chapters at a time uh, of content so so that the functionality is there for that too awesome okay thank if, you yeah if, if, if you guys are interested I'd be glad to to visit with you further about it that'd be great thank you other questions talking about all right I guess uh, it's as much as I have to share, and I uh, appreciate your time and attention on this.